Welcome to Dune Chapter by Chapter. And this is the companion video to Chapter 5. So this is the discussion portion. So this chapter is pretty short. Uh, Dune is like that. It'll have like uh, some fairly long chapters and some really short ones there as you go throughout the book. So in this one, we get to meet Dr. Yue. And he is the house doctor and he's a Sook doctor. And he has Imperial Conditioning. So that means that he is conditioned that uh, any he's safe to minister to any one of the great houses. Uh, that under no kind of torture can that conditioning be broke. So he can't be coerced or tortured or or, or made to put in a position where he's going to assassinate anyone. So if you have if one of these doctors has that conditioning, they can even administer to the Padishar Emperor without any worry of them assassinating. But the Harkonnens have found a way to corrupt his conditioning, and he is basically the Harkonnens' ace in the hole against the Atreides. This is the thing the Atreides aren't really uh, counting on or figuring for. When when they, they know they're going to Arrakis, and they know that there is a big trap waiting for them, the whole planet is one big man trap. So it's an uh, interesting thing. And uh, so in this chapter, Dr. Yui shows up. It's kind of interesting. The last, so many, all these chapters are kind of like Paul, we're being introduced to all these people in Paul's life. Like it was Hawat and Gurney in the last chapter. Now this one is Dr. Yue. And then uh, right away, beginning with his mother and uh, the Bene, Ge Bene Gesserit, uh, Gaius Helen Mohim. And uh, so in this one, he's just finishing his workout with... Uh, gurney and he's just finished getting a masseuse and or just finished getting a massage and now he's all relaxed and so dr yui is gonna skip their usual lessons that they usually go through and because he's going on to arrakis so he's prepared some uh, some uh, lessons for him during the crossing and then what's interesting about that is we get to go into dr yui's mind and we get to learn exactly what it is the Harkonnens have over him. And it's his wife, Wana. So he's married to a Bene Gesserit woman. And the Harkonnens... Now, in this chapter, it doesn't outline exactly what they're doing. But you kind of get the impression that they have his wife. And they're doing something horrible to her. And the only way he can get it to stop is by betraying the Atreides. And now, the way Dune is, it's never that simple. It's never so simple as he's just going to betray the Baron... Or he's just going to betray Duke Leto and then the Baron's going to have his way. Now, Yui's got his own plan. One that even the Baron doesn't know about. Because that's the thing about Dune. It's all plans within plans. And uh, so in this exchange he's having with Paul, he's uh, they're discussing Arrakis and they're discussing the Fremen. And uh, an interesting thing about this is we kind of get more, more detail about the Fremen of how ferocious they are. That even their women are just as ferocious and dangerous as the men. And even the children are really ferocious and dangerous. And known to be very violent. So this is the stories that's going around about the Fremen. And uh, we kind of get a makeup of the different people that live on Arrakis. You have the Fremen, but you have the other people who... They're not Fremen, but they're native to Arrakis. They're the people of the Graben and the Sink and the Pan. And, uh, but there's a lot of interbreeding with the Fremen that goes on there. Uh, so you kind of get more of a feel for the culture, the kind of different people that live on Arrakis in this chapter. And then we, they, and then the, the knife gets mentioned that they, you know, they sing songs about their knives and stuff like that. But, uh, he, but it's not mentioned yet, but eventually it will be that the knife that they, the reason why they hold their knives so dear is because uh, their knives are made out of teeth from a sandworm and they worship the sandworms as part of their religion. And then what's interesting about this chapter is it really uh, paints a good character for Dr. Yui. He's, you know, he's, he obviously like, he's very torn by what he's being forced to do. He's being forced to betray the Atreides, but you can still tell he still has a great affection for the Atreides and, and Paul, and he's torn with guilt. He doesn't want to betray them, but he just can't handle any more harm coming to his wife because of the Harkonnens. And now he, he even hates himself because he was, and he hates the Harkonnens even more because they picked him to be this traitor. They didn't pick anyone else, they picked him. 
because he would be the least likely to be suspected because of his imperial conditioning. And then the other thing that kind of comes up that's interesting is the Orange Catholic Bible. So the Orange Catholic Bible was kind of a product of the Great Convention after the Machine Wars, after the Great uh, Jihad against thinking machines, that this was kind of like a combo of a lot of different religions that went into this Orange Catholic Bible. And uh, one of its greatest commandments that was mentioned earlier is that thou shalt not make um, machines mine in the thou shalt make thou shalt not make a machine in the image of a man's mind kind of thing. That's one of its holy commandments. And we get a little bit of description of some some technology here, like like in Dune, like they're kind of gone more low tech than other science fictions, but they still have some like science fiction elements. So this one is like. You know, a small little tiny book that goes in the palm of your hand, but, it, and it, but you can't touch the pages, and it's just like electrostatic that pushes the pages apart and with a magnifier that slides in place. And as I was reading this chapter, I was actually thinking, now, are they going to do this scene? Because they're going to do some scene like it, but if they do this scene in the upcoming movie that's going to be out next year in 2020, will, the, will we get to see on screen the Orange Catholic Bible like in Paul's hand, a miniature version of it that flips the pages, and how is that going to look on screen? Because I always kind of have trouble picturing how the magnifying part works, or where it sits on the book, and how it slides over, and things like that. Uh, because it's described as being so small, and how big the magnifier is, and how much it blows up the, the words. So that's uh, going to be an interesting visual thing if they do that on screen. And how this whole exchange will go down. Uh, with Paul and Dr. Yue. So, uh, yeah, and it, and it just another chapter that really, really, it's really setting up the Harkonnens are really like evil. <laughs> There's no two ways around it. What they're doing to Dr. Yue. And Dr. Yue, this whole thing of him being a traitor becomes something that's very interesting later on in the book, how he kind of double crosses the Harkonnens and their plan Hana doesn't really go the way they want it to because Yui is a betrayer. He he's he's a traitor, so he not only uh, betrays the Atreides, but he also turns on the Harkonnens too. He betrays them, the ones who forced him to be a betrayer. And uh, and the the poem that he reads out when Paul accidentally goes to that favorite verse from the Orange Catholic Bible that uh, his wife Wana loved, and then he can't bear to hear it and he freaks out on Paul. Because uh, there were two indentations and he didn't realize it. And it went to his wife's favorite verse. And just the kind of how it talks about, you know, how being blind, and how blind are you? And that you are you blind and deaf without realizing it to the things in the world around you? And it kind of mirrors what's happening there in that scene. Because Paul is kind of blind to Dr. Yue. He doesn't realize that Dr. Yue is a threat to him. And that Dr. Yue is going to end up betraying the Atreides. Uh, because the Harkonnens have him under their thumb and they're using his wife to control him. What I kind of like about uh, Frank Herbert's writing too is he never goes into specific details about things. So that, 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 a lot of stuff is kind of like plays in your mind. Like when he says like they're harming Wana, but he never specifically, they never specifically say what they're going to do. It's kind of like with the twist in Mentat, Peter de Vries. He never... Like he never goes into detail what he would have done if he had gotten Jessica, so it's just left hanging. What are you gonna do with her? And he can't even answer, but he just wants her. So it's just just leaves that in your imagination. It's almost more powerful that way than if he actually described what he was gonna do with her. So then your mind just runs through all these horrible scenarios that they could possibly. What would he do to her? And it's the same thing with Doctor Yui's wife, with Wana. You know, what are they doing to her? How are they torturing her? things like that. So that's kind of nice when authors kind of leave stuff like that, it's like especially things that involve violence when they kind of leave it up to your imagination and they don't show you the whole thing. Like that's even more effective because then your mind will run through all these horrible scenarios. Like your mind will always go to the worst thing, you know, and then that makes the Harkonnens like the most, like the most evilest things, like the most sadistic and twisted uh, group of sci-fi villains ever. Just because of the way they're the way they're Frank Herbert written them, like in Star Wars, like Emperor Palpatine is very evil, but you could never imagine Emperor Palpatine uh, sadistically torturing and doing horrible things to a woman out of some weird perverse pleasure, like 
you know what I mean? So, like, it, it makes the Harkonnens even the more evil, more, like, just really terrible. Like, it, it does a really good job of that in this book. And, uh, uh, it's, it's, and it's really, it's got some really good juicy, uh, like dialogue in this book too. I, I like Dr. Yui, like conversing with himself in his own head as he's talking to Paul and cursing himself out and cursing out the Harkonnens for putting him in his trap. Now, one thing I want to talk about before I wrap up this video that I almost forgot to mention is in this chapter, we get to hear about the worms of Arrakis. And uh, Dr. Yue has a film book of a small specimen, only 110 meters long and 22 meters in diameter. That's a huge worm. If you came out and seen a worm that big in your backyard, you'd completely freak out. <laughs> but for, as far as worms go on Dune, that's like a small little tiny worm. And uh, there's reports of ones even bigger than that in the deep desert. So we start to get hair about the worms. And one thing about Dune, and so I've read the book four times now and now I'm going through like reading it a fifth time basically going through really a deep dive into it each chapter and I've watched uh, 84 film a bunch of times same thing with the mini series and I've watched countless videos on YouTube's of other guys talking about the lore of Dune and all this so one thing that uh, you kind of take for granted is when you're reading the book for the first time as someone knew how much mystery there is in the book. So at this point, the worms are really a big mystery in this book. You don't know what their relationship is to the planet, and you don't know that they're connected to the spice in any way, uh, which is something that you kind of take for granted. So if you're reading the book for the first time, you don't really know that these things are connected, like the Fremen, the spice, and the sandworms are all connected. Like you don't, you don't know that yet. And one thing about Dune and to my knowledge, it's never been revealed, and that's the origin of the worms. Where the worms came from, because in one of the books, I might be wrong because it's been years since I read them, but I remember this standing out in my mind when I read the books, and I think it's in Children of Dune this comes up. But it's briefly mentioned that the sandworms of Arrakis are not indigenous to the planet, that they were planted there by something. And Frank Herbert never went into it after that. Like, as far as I can tell when I read the six original books, and as far as I know, it was never brought up in the Brian Herbert and Kevin J. Anderson books either. So what I like about that is it's just left a complete mystery with just a hint of something. So it, it always made me wonder. I always thought about it afterwards. Well, if they're not, then it kind of got my imagination going. Well, who or what left them on the planet and they were planted there? Because the reason why Dune is a desert is because of the sandworms. So Dune originally wasn't like that. It was a, a planet much more close to the Earth with oceans and stuff like that. But because of the worms being introduced there, it's the worms that converted everything into a desert and changed the way the planet is. And it was put there by something. But what? We don't know. And I like that mystery. And it's one of those mysteries that should never be explained. Because some of the really great things in science fiction has been kind of ruined by explaining the mystery, uh, by ruining the mystery, by explaining it too much. It's like, it's one of those things that you think in your head, oh, it'd be so cool to know the origin of this, but really, nothing would be satisfying. It's better left wondering. That makes it more interesting. It's like the worst thing they ever did to the Alien franchise was explain the origin of the Xenomorphs by doing, a pre by doing Prometheus, the prequel, and then Alien Covenant. And then their origin is, was so unsatisfactory. Instead of just leaving it as a mystery, like what we saw in that first alien film, when you came across that derelict ship and it was full of those eggs and that fossilized alien, all these questions that, you know, you just kind of run through your head that are better left as a mystery. Uh, so I'm going to wrap the video up right there. And uh, that's everything I got to say in this video. Let me know what you think in the comments section, and I will see you at the next one.